Okay, this episode of WTF is sponsored by Merge Records, featuring artists like the Grammy Award Album of the Year winner, Arcade Fire, as well as Spoon, Super Chunk, Destroyer, and much more. Go to MergeRecords.com and get 20% off all music and merchandise with the code WTF at the checkout. Rock it. Do it. Now. Lock the gate! <laughs> Are we doing this? Really? Wait for it. Are we doing this? Wait for it. Ow! What the fuck? WTF. And it's also, eh, what the fuck? What's wrong with me? It's time for WTF. What the fuck? With Mark Marin. Okay, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck, buddies? What the fucking ears? What the fuck, Nicks? How's everything going? This is Mark Marin. This is WTF. I'm sitting naked in a hotel room in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, I spent the day out on the Capitol, hanging out with the protesters a bit, picking up on the energy, watching democracy in action, people fighting for what they believe is right, fighting for their future, union workers, people who are supporting union workers. These are public jobs, state workers, nurses, social workers, teachers, all just wanting the right to function as a union in a democratic society, to be able to have the right to collectively negotiate for their pensions, for their jobs, for when the state imposes layoffs, for what happens to those workers, how they are treated. It's an amazing thing to see. This is my job. My job includes me sitting in a hotel room naked, but I'm certainly not as naked as the anger and desperation that I see out there on the state capitol today. In terms of what the unions are, are fighting for, it's convoluted, it's, it's difficult, but it's basically the rights to be you know, protected, to have their pensions protected. And is that important? Among other things, I, I think it's important. I mean, like, example, yesterday I, I, I made a mess in my hotel room. I spilled some coffee. It was a fucking disaster in the, uh, in the bathroom because that's where the coffee maker is. I felt awful. And I walk out into the hall. I'm about to leave. I see a maid. And I said, look, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that uh, it's a mess in there. She goes, look, nothing's going to surprise me. I was a nurse, an emergency room nurse for 30 years. I've seen everything, every mess a human being could make. In the worst possible way, I've seen it. You're not going to surprise me, honey. And then I thought for a second, like, is she challenging me? I mean, I can make a bigger mess. But then on a deeper level, I thought, holy shit, why is a woman in her 60s who was an emergency room nurse for 30 years cleaning my hotel room? What kind of country is this? I don't know her backstory, but if this were a decent country, a woman in her 60s who had done a noble job like being an emergency room nurse for 30 years saving lives would not be cleaning up my fucking coffee mess. I felt ashamed. This is my job. I, I have fought for my job on some level. I have fought for the right to uh, sit in a hotel room naked in the middle of the day and prepare for a couple of shows tonight. I've, I've dedicated almost half of my life to being able to draw people to come see what I do, and it's starting to happen. It's only taken 25 years. Let me mention that today is a special day because today our guest is Conan O'Brien who obviously fought for his job as well and made some difficult choices in his life. And I got to be honest with you, I didn't know whether he was going to make good on his promise and come on my show. He promised it in front of you, in front of America. He said he would come to my garage. I really thought that I would end up going to his office and sitting down with this rig that I got right here in Madison and, you know, just getting what I get. But he is a man of his word, and he came to my garage, and he sat down with me. And I always assumed that I kind of knew the guy, but, you know, I assume that a lot with my guests, and sometimes I'm not right. And sometimes it's very hard for me to let go of my assumptions. I want them to be who I think they are, and that is not always the case, no matter how hard I push. But that wasn't the case with Conan. I always knew he was a sensitive guy. I always knew he was a hardworking guy. I always knew he was very hard on himself, but he's a very decent human being. He's got a lot of personal integrity, and it was just it was great to talk to him. And I feel very close to him because I feel like our, we, we sort of came up together in a way. I mean, it's taken me 25 years to sell tickets in this business, to get work on a regular basis in my business. It's taken me a long time to find my voice in this world of comedy and in what I'm doing now. 
in the entertainment business or whatever it is you want to call it. I struggled hard. I've gone broke many times. I've been desperate, but I, I didn't know what else to do, so I hung on. And at the beginning, when Conan was first on, he was you know, under fire. He was awkward. Uh, he was having a difficult time finding his legs on TV, on camera, uh, with his own voice. And I was one of the original guests as a comic on, you know, in that first year of the Conan O'Brien show on NBC. And he had me on three or four times a year during the entire run. And I, I felt close to him. I felt grateful to him. And then I went to meet with uh, the head of Conan's production company on some other business. And I went to the new set of the new show. And I saw all the old people from the old show. I really had to fight back tears Almost, because I was connected to these people. I'd been doing that, that show for, for so many years, and I missed it. I, I, I hadn't seen any of them in about a year during the whole Tonight Show run. I was, I was sort of amazed at how emotional I got. And then when they asked me to do the new show, when I got there, I was, I was ecstatic in a way that wasn't just about doing television. It was, I felt like I was back with the, like it was a reunion of some kind, and Andy was there, and I felt like I was among friends. And I, again, I had to fight back tears before I went on the air. It was great. It was it was like being with old friends. And Conan said he'd come on the show, and he came on the show, and it was great. And we just hung out, and we talked, and you're going to hear that now. And it was it was weird because we I do feel close to the guy, and you know we chatted a little before we went into the garage in the kitchen. And then we did the interview, and then we we had this long talk, and then we're back at my house in the dining room, and we're having chit chat. And you know he came after he recorded the show. It was seven at night, and. There was this weird, awkward moment where we're just talking and we're standing there. And in my mind, I'm like, holy fuck, Conan O'Brien is in my house. What do I do now? What, what happens now? How long is this going to go on for? I, I literally got sort of awkward. And, but, you know, I thanked him and gave him some coffee, some justcoffee.co up and said goodbye. And, and, I, and I was thrilled that we were able to do that. And by the way, justcoffee.co up is here in Madison, Wisconsin. I went over there today, spent some time at the uh, at the warehouse looking at the uh, the machinery uh, what a great operation so go to justcoffee.coop and now let's go to the garage and listen to me and Conan O'Brien I got to be honest with you I was a little late on Arcade Fire but when I found them I thought they were fucking awesome Someone tweeted that, like, I missed the party. I don't need a party. If I'm at a party, I don't know whether I really like it or I'm just subject to groupthink. I was happy to find Arcade Fire later than they were the party. And you know what? Arcade Fire, Merge Records. When I got my package of stuff from Merge Records, I was like, it was like Christmas. I had no fucking idea that they had such great fucking music. Super Chunk, are you kidding me? I don't pay a lot of attention to labels. I'm not that nerdy about it. But Super Chunk, they've been purveyors of fine indie rock since the beginning of indie rock, since the late 80s. They fucking kick ass. Also on Merge Records, Telekinesis, Caribou, Apex Manor, Spoon. They actually put out a collection of the Big Dipper, who was a band that I knew back in Boston when I was in college. Merge Records is our sponsor today, and I'm, I'm fucking ecstatic that they are sponsoring the show. And here's the deal. If you listen to my show, you can get 20% off all Merge music and merchandise by using the code WTF at checkout. Just go to MergeRecords.com slash store. You can preview and purchase albums on CD, LP. There's digital download. They have Merge gear. They've got T-shirts, tote bags, all of it. 20% off with the code WTF. They're also on Twitter, if you're into that, at Merge Records on Twitter. They're on Facebook. You can sign up for their monthly newsletter at MergeRecords.com. Are you fucking kidding me? Super Chunk? They fucking rock. Arcade Fire? Genius. Merge Records. What a great fucking sponsor. It's, uh, you know what? I, you know, I love this show. MergeRecords.com slash store. WTF. That's the code. 20% off. <laughs> Well, got to play by the rules. In uh, in my garage is Conan O'Brien. I you know I am I'm a little nervous. Why is that? Well, you know I've known you a long time. Mm -hmm. I've done your show a lot. People often assume that we are our best friends or we're buddies because I'm on the show a lot. But we don't really have a relationship off off uh, screen, do we? No, not no. that I know of. I mean, I've unless I've been at dinner and I didn't remember. It You've at tried all. several <laughs> times, and I've. I've quashed it immediately. Uh, you know, it's funny because I have that same, there's, uh, you know, for years, I mean, thousands of hours and people will come on and there are certain people 
and you're one who've come that you come on a lot and we talk and we know each other right. and we get into this nice zone that can last 11 12 minutes uh and then we've done that so much over the years and then you know we don't hang out outside the show i don't really hang out with uh um, you know, I don't have lots of, like, a rat pack of comedy pals. I never did. How the hell are you going to have time? Yeah. You know, I just, I, I would do the show, and but even when I had time, I yeah. didn't do it. Yeah. I would just go home and sort of go into a funk and uh, yeah. eat cheese popcorn and wait, Nap. you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's nice. This is nice. We'll finally get to know each other here. Well, the interesting thing is, and, and, I'll, and it won't surprise you, because I think you have a sense of, of how my brain works, is that um, I, I just read the book. The, the war for late night right out of out of literally out of concern for you mm-hmm. like i was like what did he go through i right. yeah, i wasn't really concerned with a who done it right but uh, i have a very uh, self-centered view of show business now when mm-hmm. you were hosting the tonight show i knew i was slotted for some point in the future and uh and when when it when it, when all the shit went down i literally had a moment where i'm like well i wonder you know if conan knows that i was slotted to do it <laughs> You know what? It was, it almost, <laughs> I almost decided to stay because of that. Uh, right. Um, I don't know what the hell prepared you to deal with even the, the first wave of stuff. This is always something I've been obsessed with, mm-hmm. with you, is that where do you get the fortitude to to deal with that? You know what I have found over the years, and it's going to sound like I'm making a joke and I'm not. You can make that a joke. The, uh, no, 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 I won't. Because oh, okay. this doesn't pay. Um <laughs> Okay. So this is, you're going to get a serious interview because okay. no one's paying for the funny stuff. Okay. But uh, I, I swear to God, this is true. Get yourselves into situations where you don't have a choice. And I really believe that's the definition of accomplishing a lot of things in this life. As uh, I, I have some part of me because I'm not. I'm not a brave person. I don't even think of myself as someone who has uh, a lot of guts. But I will get myself into situations where. The house is on fire and there's only one way out, which is through the front door. And then people later on give you credit for going through the front door. And you say, well, there was really nowhere else to go. I mean, there was no... Right. Uh, in 93, when I replaced David Letterman from Complete Obscurity, I got myself into a situation and I was very aware that, man, this this is a fucking serious situation I'm in. And the only way out was to survive it. That's the only way out. Because if I had you know, been taken off the air after six months, I would just become a trivial pursuit question but you know, also who... survive it but do your job i mean and, right. and excel at that i mean that that like when i really think like for some reason i get hung up on um on harvard you know because i just you know i saw the right. social network and right. and is there some sort of secret wisdom that no isn't... god no well first of all the harvard you saw on the social network doesn't exist it doesn't oh, that's it's good. Uh, yeah uh there are no Women don't look like that. Twins? A lot of sets no, of twins. No, no. I mean, I, I looked at that movie and I thought, I don't know where I was. This was clearly a different time, but lots of incredible looking uh, supermodels yeah, walking course. around, taking off their underwear and, and giving guys blowjobs. They and, bust them in, apparently. Yeah, bust them in, and there are guys with headsets. Now, it's possible that existed somewhere, but nobody I know ever saw that. Nobody. We all had cold sores and we had diphtheria. <laughs> And it was cold, and we wore <laughs> shitty clothes scarves. and uh, scarves, Mittens. and the guys looked horrible. The women looked like you know Emily Dickinson after a bike accident. I mean, it was a it was a sham. The whole thing was a, and we all survived it. It was it's it's uh, it was always gray and raining, and they were tearing up the subway the whole time I was at uh, Harvard. What from, year were you there? Oh, I was I, there from eighty one to eighty four. Because I was around then. I was at yeah. I was at uh, well Boston University. It's across the uh, river there. Uh, from eighty one, <laughs> I've heard, I've heard tell. Uh, yeah, but so, it's but, but you know they they the whole place was under construction the whole time I was there. But there's no like I I I want to demystify Harvard. I mean, so what is this idea that there's some sort of Harvard camp within comedy? Is it just because relationships are built? There's no secret sort of like this is the secret comedy puzzle. No, there is a uh, there is first of all there is a secret comedy puzzle. And you, and you know how <laughs> yeah, to do it. And I I can tell you. <laughs> But I can't say it on the air. <laughs> okay, or, all right. I'll have my ass. But uh, there is a trick to it all, and only you and Howie Mandel are going to crack it. Okay. Um, but the the what is true is that there's a the Harvard Lampoon within Harvard, and that is the you know the country's oldest humor magazine it started in 1876, and that is a place that from Doug Kenny and Henry Beard, and you know it's collected some really funny. It's attracted some talented people over the years. And when I was there, I fell into that organization 
you you submit comedy to get in. So it is a meritocracy. They're looking for funny people that can write stuff. So you got to be smart. You got to be funny. You got to be funny, and you, and you can go. You can be. You can get accepted as an artist. You can get accepted. Uh, some people get in on the business side, but uh, we. You know, I got into that. Yeah. And that changed my life. That was 1981. And what is true is when I got out to Los Angeles, there was a couple of people that I had graduated years before me, but they were on the Lampoon. I mean, uh, Jim Downey, one of the funniest people I've ever met, who's head writer forever at Saturday Night Live, and he's still there doing stuff. Um, he was a Lampoon guy. And so you'd know a couple of these guys, and it, it I, I heard these names, Max Prost, Tom Gamble, George Meyer, and these are it. It helped to know a few of those names. So, so I'm not going to lie like, about that. It, it does help to have a few connections. So it's a skull and bones of clowns. Yes, it's a skull and <laughs> skull and bones of nerdy, uh, <laughs> self-effacing uh, comedy geeks. Yes. <laughs> so it's just about it. It's just really about a, a network. It's not that because I've I've always wanted to believe that you're imparted secret wisdom at Harvard, but really you're just no. introduced and socialized with some of the smartest people. Around. But also some of the dumbest. I mean, that I, I'm the first to de demystify or demythologize Harvard. I don't think um, I met some really smart people there. Yeah. I met some dumb people there. I met people that had no uh, emotional intelligence. Um, you know, uh, I met uh, some of my best friends there. I also met horrible people there. It's a big melting pot. It is not, um, uh, you know, I, 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 Many people would agree, too. I don't think it's like the greatest undergraduate education you could ever have. I think it all depends on what you're looking for. But it has for. some cachet. It has some cachet, and it, yeah. it attracts some very interesting people. I would say there's no. it was no surprise to me when they caught the Unabomber, and he turned out to be a guy from Harvard. I was not... Someone said, oh, they caught the Unabomber, and he was a lone weirdo who, uh, he went to Harvard, and I thought, well, of course he did. The media was saying, how could this be? Well, it makes, I knew seven of, I knew seven Unabombers. Well, they're going to do big things, either on the dark or the light yes. side. Yes, yeah. They're and... going to achieve something, and he was the best of the of the bombers. Sure, he was one of the greats. Right. So he lived out there by himself in a small cabin. Somewhere there's focused. a Yale random bomber who's infurious. <laughs> yeah, he was... My time has been taken. <laughs> Well, is it weird to you that uh, on some level that, you know, or does it make sense on some level that all these people that went to Harvard and all these people that you knew sort of rise at the same time? I mean, I had no idea that, you know, Jeff Zucker went right. to Harvard. I mean, is that odd to you? No, it's not odd in a way. It kind of makes sense that yeah. everybody, uh, you know, if you made a movie, yeah. when you see a lot of classic yeah. movies that tell a tale... And, and and these this is the format they used in the 1930s in yeah. classic movies like the Roaring Twenties. Everybody meets each other in the first scene in World War One, and they're doughboys fighting together in a trench. And then they split up and shake hands. And then ten years later, they're all robbing a bank and they run into each other in an alley. And then <laughs> they run into each other again in ten years, and one's the district attorney and the other one. And and it's uh, it's kind of how it works. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I, it doesn't. And you know what? In comedy, when I came out to Los Angeles, I met all these people. Eighty uh, five. In eighty five, I came out here, but and I, and I've, over time, I met all these people, and it's the same cast of characters. Yeah. I mean, everyone just keeps popping up, and it is funny that you're assigned a set of characters when you're born, and they keep showing up in your life. And that's just how it Surprise! works. Yeah. Oh, it's you again. Isn't that weird, though? I mean, it's it's strange to me that that it's... It, do you think it's insulated like that? Is that protected? I, or, I mean... I don't know. I do think... I do think God and whatever God means, but there's some... I really believe that some there is a force in the universe that has a sense of humor. When because because two, these things are just too Yeah, it's beyond weird. coincidence yeah. that, that it's such a small world and we keep running into each other. Now, but when you were younger, did you, how, what kind of track were you on? I mean, were you going to Harvard? Did you have that kind of pressure I was at home? not. I had no, I'd always been fascinated in comedy. I'd always been fascinated in being an entertainer. I had, I used to, you know, uh, it's kind of, um, it sounds weird now, but I constantly wrote plays and bugged my school to let me put them on How old? and I would star in them. I was like, you know, I was like nine. You, you know, I mean I was constantly Do you remember any of the oh, I remember why I wrote some I wrote a show about, you know, where a buddy and I meet and become big stars and you know, I, I we wrote songs to it. We basically just ripped off popular songs and right. put, but uh And, and you then, performed it? And then we performed it and I remembered insisting that it have a real the whole play was only about fifteen minutes long. 
But I had been to a play, one play in New York, and I had known that they had an intermission that lasted 25 minutes. So I insisted on a 25-minute intermission seven minutes into our 15-minute show. And the teachers were so pissed at me. They were afterwards, I was like, well, that was quite a show, wasn't it? What the fuck? It stopped. <laughs> what happened? So I had this, these weird ideas about being in show business. And then I basically, uh, I think I was an anxious kid. I was, uh, you know, I, it's not a glamorous, I was not the class clown. I was funny for my friends, but quiet in the classroom. And I worked really hard and I was kind of grim. And I have to say, I didn't really enjoy my childhood. Through socially, my fourth. socially uncomfortable? I was not socially uncomfortable, no, because I could make my friends laugh. But I just, I was not... Easy going from fourth it's grade till when? Till like now. I mean, I'm not an easy going, uh, and, and you know, it's interesting because I think people. Me neither. People, you know, but people have this idea when they get to know you, or they think uh, you're in comedy. They think, oh, you know, you must be some freewheeling fun. And I always took things very seriously. Got very down on myself, uh, and went into kind of a dark place. And so. And then the flip side of that would be comedy was my escape. Comedy was the way that I would burst out of that. So I was a very serious student. I had no intention of getting into, you know, when I went to Harvard, I didn't even think about going on the Harvard Lampoon until literally my college roommate, David, you know, John O'Connor said, I'm going. And I said, I guess I'll go along with you. And that changed my life. What were you thinking about doing? I was thinking about I'd go to the school of government or I'd. I'd What'd you major in? I majored in history and literature of America. I wrote a thesis called Literary Progeria and the Works of Flannery O'Connor. And William Faulkner. I still don't know what that means. I don't know what progeria means. Progeria is the disease where you age prematurely. You know, kids get it and that's they become. Fu- that's and so I, deep, I, th- I thought there were, I thought that the South had unique, a unique literary device where Southern writers put the children in Southern literature were prematurely old, because it captured the experience of the American South, which is that they were part of a powerful nation, but they were poor. They were part of a nation that had never been defeated. Yet they had known defeat, uh, and then so that was this dichotomy. I don't know. That's I, great. I thought did, it was pretty did, good. Did you yeah. do well on that? I did. I did. It did well, and I actually uh, I, gra- I graduated magna. You know, really? And, yeah, I was like a serious, and I was running the lampoon at the same time. I was a. Uh, I I drove myself really hard. Well, know? Faulkner was like I. You know, I got, I became obsessed with Faulkner for a while, right? Because I was an English major, but I was not a good student. But like the Quentin section of the Sound and the Fury, mm-hmm. I obsessed over. Yeah, did I mean? Did you relate to that? <laughs> yes, yes, I did. As a man child. <laughs> well, not well. No, that was the the yeah. other guy, Benji. Yeah, that's Benji. But, but Quentin right. was the the sort of existential Harvard right. student, that right? Right. Ended up jumping off that bridge with yes. these irons on his feet. Yes. Yeah, and it was so weird and morose and hard to read. And Faulkner was so like, uh, it like it makes me want to do that. Well. Yeah, and then you realize he also looked the part. Yeah. Faulkner looked like the great Southern writer. Yeah, I mean, he looked like a Civil War general. Yeah, and uh, but then have you been, have been to his house? He has a in, house in Rowan. What's it called? It's in Oxford, Oxford, Mississippi. Mississippi right, and uh, you know you can see where he wrote. So you went on sort of a pilgrimage. No, I just I was did a road trip once with my friends, and I knew, realized we were driving through Mississippi, and I said we've got to stop by. I've got to see his plantation and. Uh, See the room where he wrote all that stuff. I mean, he literally, you know, it's old school. What a know? fucking mind, though. I yeah. mean, like, the, you know, he wrote, you know, paragraph long sentences. I used to just get obsessed about these sentences, like the Reavers, even, which is like probably yeah. the most accessible book. Yeah. Do you ever read that stuff now? I have not read him in a long time. Did you like it? I did. I did like it. And I also f- was frustrated. I actually preferred Flannery O'Connor. She was, I don't know if you've read much of her, but Rise she's. Blood, I read. She's great. And, um,. And hardcore, they're completely unsentimental and tough. And you'd never know. If you read it, you'd think this is some cynical, it sounds like a sexist thing to say. But right. you read it and you realize it was written uh, you know, in the 50s. And you think, well, this is some cynical, hardcore, alcoholic asshole. And then you find out that it's a very religious, uh, frail uh, young woman. Yeah. You know, who's, and she was kind of funny. Yeah, very funny. I mean, darkly Wicked, funny. Wickedly funny, right. yeah. So... Uh, yeah, I, you know, that's the thing that, um, the one thing, the one quality that I like to take through life is uh, not to be a snob one way or the other, and also not to be a reverse elitist. You know, you're, I think Flannery O'Connor is really funny, uh, and I can appreciate that, but I also can appreciate, you know, the Three Stooges. You know, it's just trying to, I think there's some people that are always trying to demarcate 
you know, in a kind of a oh, yeah. Yeah, angry a, comedy bully way. Well, I think there's a lot of people that, that, and I was talking to someone else about this today, that there seems to be this, you know, this cultural uh, 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 propensity to create conflict, to, to create competitions where there aren't any, yeah. to challenge people to do this or that. Yeah. That that seems to have taken the place of, of human experience, you know, interaction now. Right. It's fucking, it's annoying. Well, within the, you know, I think also this is the theory I've come up with, which yeah. is that, that, you see it in politics now, and you also see it in uh, pop culture. A strong opinion. There's so much noise out there that the only thing that cuts through is a strong opinion. Mm-hmm. So everyone has strong opinions. So, you know, this sucks. Um, do you know what I mean? Yeah. This person's a god, and this yeah. person sucks. Right, that's and, it. And yeah. that's really it. And I think you see it in politics. Like, there's no room for a nuanced view anymore. It's just... Which is what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be nuanced, <laughs> but now it's you're either, you know, it's uh, the right and the left. Both have yeah. sort of giant paper mache puppets that yeah. exaggerate that, that uh, and, and people enjoy that. It's almost like you can inge- you can generate more energy with that. And I think in comedy, too, there's a lot of... You know, that's the thing that uh, the one th- aspect of the social media and the web that depresses me is you just see the, you know, flamethrowers that go through and they've got to love something or hate something. You it's know? Re- it's and annoying it's, and it's uh, it's reactive and it's 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 over emotional and it's it's ultimately shallow, you know, because you can't appreciate stuff. Right. Now, when you were a kid, like what did what did all your siblings end up doing? How many you got? I'm one of six. That's so a lot. were you really Catholic? Yeah, yeah, we were hardcore Catholic growing up. I mean, Church my parents, my pa- yeah, my parents are, yeah, the whole nine yards. It, 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 it's in my bones. I mean, as much as I've tried to uh, evolve past it in certain ways, uh, it's in my bones. What are the liabilities of it, carrying it with you in your mind? Body shame. <laughs> uh, <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, just, uh, you know, it's funny because I've been On accused. On what level? I've been accused over the years of, oh, you're so, you know, you're self-deprecating and that's your act. And I was like, you know, it really comes from finding myself uh, you know uh f- very flawed i think that's at the root of catholicism is we're just flawed and so there's nothing we can do about it <laughs> and there's nothing we can do about it and so i grew up just you know having a very dark self view <laughs> what, what, you were too tall or too what too skinny too tall you know my dick's too big yeah. you know it's just gonna hurt somebody <laughs> well i don't want i hate to get that out there as a rumor but do you know what i mean my <laughs> My, yeah, no, sure. my dick is huge. Yeah, and it's yeah. it's a lot of got a lot of girth. Hurt, hurt people. You don't want to hurt people. Well, no. The thing is, and I was so worried for a long time. And I actually had doctors say you're going to hurt someone with that. And then it was only later in life that I found out that you know this is a great gift. But <laughs> for years, for years, but for years, I lived with the shame of this. You know, my penis is too big. I hope no woman ever finds out. <laughs> handicap. Yeah. Horrible handicap. And so you know, you live with these things, and then you eventually you learn to work with them. But do you think it had anything that that it also propelled you that your drive is somehow to to transcend all that shit? Yeah, I think I have a lot of. Uh, I did not. I'm always suspicious. I'll say this: I'm always <laughs> suspicious when, a, if I think a comedian's too good looking, right? Uh, and they were a great athlete when they were young. I almost, I just can't believe that they're going to be any good. Do you know I, what I mean? I, I really I, believe dude, that. I, I, yeah, I, 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 you know, and and I'll sometimes. Have I really, know a few. I'll have I'll have some you know really good looking like intern on the show yeah. who told me that you know tells me that he's also a great basketball player or something will say yeah i'm thinking of going into stand up and i just want to say well then no 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 yeah. this is for us this yeah. is our consolation so prize hilarious. our consolation prize is that you know we we couldn't do all those things so we had to hyper develop this weird <laughs> self abusive charm um, yeah ch- <laughs> whatever it is yeah. you know my father said to me once um he listened to some. He watched me do some interview or something. And, Recently? No, this is a while ago. And and, and but I really, you know, was uh, being very left brain and got out there. And and but people laughed a lot. And my father afterwards said, "It's funny." He said, "You're making money off of something that really should be treated." You know. And I thought, <laughs> yeah, that's really the essence of what we're all doing. We're just. You is know, he a doctor? He is a doctor. What yeah. kind of doctor? He is a microbiologist. Oh. My dad. Works wow. with the World Health Organization, travels the world. He's a brilliant guy. Is he uh, about? Is it about diseases? Yes, yes, and antibiotic resistance. That's oh. his big specialty. Is that We've a, overused antibiotics? We're in trouble with that now, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I, I never take them. Do you take them? No, but the problem is that it's not you. Uh, it's not us taking them. It's uh, the cows. Yeah, it's the cows. Them giving them the uh, you know the and and also just uh, the more people that are out there taking gobs of them, uh, they're creating. 
resistant antibiotic resistant bacteria that you will get. They're petri will, dishes of it will the, kill you. Yes, the apocalypse. Yeah, so it, you, you know you can take good care of yourself, yeah. but it won't matter. I had a dad who was a doctor. Now, did you? Uh, this is just uh, between me and you. Like I found that you know my father was a bit distant because he's very busy saving mm-hmm. lives and whatnot. Yes. Were you ever a hypochondriac to get your dad's attention? Uh, oh, wow, that's a good question. I think I so was not a hypochondriac, but I probably feigned illnesses to get my parents' attention. But I don't think I was a. Uh, I didn't believe I had the illness. I just, you know, when you're one of six, you want you ha- you got to do anything <laughs> to get some face time. So I was not beyond trying to just, uh, you know, uh, have something. I mean, I remembered envying. I read Death Be Not Proud. Yeah, with uh, the John Gunther Jr. story. Uh, John the baseball Gunther player. Some, no, Death Be Not Proud oh, is no, about the like boy who's like 14 and he gets a. He gets a brain tumor, oh. and um, it's really touching, and yeah. everyone, you know, you're supposed to read it when you're 13, 14 years old, and yeah. you're supposed to just feel so terrible for the boy. Yeah. And I read it, and I thought, man, that guy's getting so much attention. <laughs> I remember envying a kid with a brain tumor, and he dies at the end of the book, and I remember thinking, man, <laughs> the brain pre- tumor, that's the way to go. <laughs> the presence he got. Yeah, that's bad. And you were the middle kid? I was, yeah, kind of the middle. W- what everyone else ended up doing? Um, let's see, uh, you know, it's, uh, my brother Neil uh, restores automobiles. My brother Luke is a lawyer. My brother Justin's a lawyer. My brother, uh, my, my, uh, uh, sister Kate was just, uh, in the fighter. She had never, she is a teacher. Which one? Um, she was one of the sisters in the really? fighter. Yeah. And she, when, when on the Oscars, she'd never acted in anything. And then she did a local commercial in Boston for the Bruins. And she went to a cattle call and just got picked. Yeah. And then that person remembered her and said, hey, you might want to try out for this other thing. So my sister called me about a year and a half ago and said, oh, I'm going to be doing a movie. And I thought, well, she'll be doing a, you know, yeah. a movie, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. like a student film uh-huh. probably. And I said, who's directing it? And she said, David O. Russell. And I said, David O. Russell? The, not, not the same David O. Russell. And she said, I think so. And I said, well, I, you know, is anybody in this thing? And she was like, well, you know, Mark Wahlberg's in it. I said, really? Mark Wahlberg? And she said, yeah, and uh, Christian Bale. And um, so she made this movie, and then we all kind of forgot about it because they were putting it together. Did she called it The Fighter? The Fighter. She's one of the sisters in The Fighter. She doesn't talk like that, though. No, she doesn't. But she can. Right. She can when she needs to. Well, if you and, grow up there, and you, you can. Yeah, and she, uh, anyway, she was, I'm watching the Oscars the other night, and Melissa, they show the clip from Melissa Leo, and it's my sister's one big line in the movie. Was she talking back to her? Sh- were, and she, yeah. she is. It's the you know, and I, and they. It's a giant single of my sister Kate up there on the screen delivering this line, and then they cut to like Warren Beatty applauding. I'm like, oh my god! <laughs> it's just it's the story that must infuriate every actor out there who spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on classes and was a waiter and did everything. And yeah, it never. And my sister. You know, walks into the casino, rolls the dice. Was she wins thrilled? The She's thrilled. Yeah, she and, loves it. And your little sister was that she? Uh, more? Jane. Uh, Jane worked here in, for a while in uh, in Los Angeles, uh, doing some comedy writing on shows, and then she moved up north. And she, you know, works on like spec scripts and things like that. And she uh, is uh, she comes down here occasionally and takes meetings. Um, but, but you're she, all still close. Yeah, we're all pretty close. Yeah. And your parents are still alive. Yep. yep. That's. That's great. Yeah, my dad's eighty-two. I think he'll he'd be horrified if I mention that. He, well, let me, let me admit, my dad is fifty-two. Okay, I, we I can, misspoke. We can we can uh, we can uh, correct that yeah. in post. Yeah. Now, do, are they happy for you? Yeah, yeah, they are. They are. Um, was there a period where your father was like, "What are you doing?" You know what? I will tell you. Uh, the I think there was a moment of trepidation, but I started earning a check almost immediately. I when you were writing for I, not necessarily the news, which was my first gig. My writing partner Greg Daniels, who's got the on to half the shows yeah. and TV. <laughs> Do you guys um, still talk? Oh yeah, all oh, the time. Oh. And uh, but he um, he and I decided to you know as we were graduating, hey, let's try this, let's try it, and let's try it together. Mm. So we uh, we got a job almost immediately on not necessarily the news. And the minute you are getting a check. Your parents don't care what you're doing. It's more than a phase. Yeah, yeah. Well, they don't care. You yeah. could say, you know what, I'm, I'm a hitman. I murder people for the mafia. Oh, you know, but I'm getting paid, what, making my own rent, and was, they're happy. Was there that sense of competition though that you needed to do something more intelligent? 
No. Oh, that's good. No, I didn't have that. I, I it, clearly you're you're working through some personal issues through me. Did you have that? Well, I had the thing where where there because my dad was a doctor. There was a the sort of sense that you know that was a path. You yes. know that that was a noble path. It was right. a sort of guaranteed path. Right. You know, you studied hard. You you, you dedicated your life to this thing, right. and then you got this reward. You know, out, well, he's now working out of a strip mall in a pain management clinic. But that's a whole other story, and that's my issues. Yes. But you didn't have that. Uh, your father didn't have that impact on you. No, he didn't. My dad, you know, to their credit, my parents were very much uh, people that believed you got to do what makes you happy so there was no oh, sense good. my dad never acted as if medicine was the family business right um you know his parents hadn't no one in his family had been a doctor so he found his own thing and my mother was a lawyer and uh but there was no sense that oh, i've got to do that and so my you, and, and no no one else seemed to be doing it so i didn't have to so you had like a healthy family for the most part it's interesting uh and you're still yes. kind of dark it, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because you can say, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, I remember growing when I was a kid, thinking my family's weird. We're just weird. I, I don't know how to put my, uh, my finger on it. Yeah. I, I grew up thinking we're not, and maybe everyone grows up that way. But I remember thinking we're kind of like an Irish Catholic Adams family. Like there's something off with us. <laughs> so I very much grew up feeling where, uh, now my mother would be horrified. She yeah. said, that's not true. <laughs> How oh, dare my mother is Margaret Dumont in the Marx Brothers movies? Well, I uh, I don't know why you would say that. It's not true, yeah. but uh, but that was the feeling that my brothers and sisters all had was yeah. we're an odd family, and we never quite knew what we were because we lived in a nice house, but it was near uh, where the Irish Catholic kids lived, whose parents were you know la mowed lawns. You mean for like the, the town. working class? Uh, yeah, and, Irish so, and so who wore the hockey jackets, right? And, you know, we'd get. We did never you get along with them. You know, it's funny. I kind of did. Fucking O'Brien. Yeah, and I remembered uh, they. You know, when I was there's a whole phase where people where people realized my name was Conan and that that matched up with Conan O'Brien with Conan the Barbarian, yeah. which was like around when I was Conan you know, the Barbarian. And there, was, there, was, there was a lot of like, hey, where's your sword? Yeah. Where's your sword? And um, <laughs> but I remember, <laughs> yeah, but I remember. No, I I get knocked around every now and then. You but, did? Oh yeah, like fist fights. Yeah, I completely. This is not my nose. My nose was completely was rebuilt. Shattered. No, it was. I was beaten up. Uh, I ran into like, yeah, I'm not kidding. I ran into a street gang who, and I was wearing a T-shirt that had the Irish flag on it, and I they were Italian, uh, and th this was right near the aquarium in Boston. Down uh, and by I was the with water. My yeah, I was with my friend at the time, John Madeiras, and this is late high school. So it's near the North End, kind of. Yeah, and they uh, beat the shit out of me. Got um, him too. No, left him alone because I, I was a little bit of a wise guy. They said they wanted 50 cents, and I said no. And they said, why not? And I said, I don't feel like it. And just as I finished that uh, it, <laughs> the t sound, um, I got hit so hard in the face. Um, did, you, never, did you fight back? I, I mean, I got hit a bunch of times so hard in the face that I don't think I did much. I don't remember. And I remember they were, it was over pretty quickly, and then uh, I had to have my – I went to um, – the, I went to the emergency room, and uh, the doctor, I'll never forget his name, Dr. Constable, he had a British accent, and he looked kind of crazy, he had crazy hair, and he looked like uh, the poet Ezra Pound, and I yeah. said, and I said, is my nose broken? And he said, broken? Good God, man, it's a bag of bones. <laughs> I'll never forget that. That's a true story. <laughs> bag of bones. It's a bag of bones. Well, you seem so fucking uh, relaxed. Do you feel relaxed? Uh... Just in general, in yeah. life? Yeah, I think I've been... I'm more relaxed now than I was... Uh, I think I've just... You know, I've been through a lot of things. I've been through a lot of change. I've been through... And I think I'm starting to wise up a little bit. I what? do think I'm starting to feel a little bit like... I used to believe that worry was a talisman against something bad happening to you. And I think I've had way too many experiences where... Uh, as I'm a worrier and I'm a guy that prepares and I'm a guy that really tries to plan it out and make sure every, that I take care of everything. And you can do that and it, things can still go to shit. So it, you relax a little bit as you get older. Because you, you realize, realize... Yeah, it doesn't. It, it's no guarantee against things. So why not try and enjoy it a little more? And you don't have control over everything. Yeah. Because like I remember... Like, and i got to be honest. like The new show is great. You, mm -hmm. you seem relaxed. Mm -hmm. It was fun doing it. I was, right. I, you know, I was actually happier that I was on this show. Right. Then the Tonight Show. Right. It was great seeing Andy, and it's just the whole and the bits you're doing are you know back to you know right you know edgy bits. Right. You can feel that, right? Yeah, I think 
you know, there's a nice thing, which is, I realize that someone pointed this out to me and I hadn't realized it, that every other show I've done, I've inherited from someone else. And what happens when you inherit a show, you know, it's a franchise, either the late, late night yeah. with Conan O'Brien had been late night with David Letterman, the right. show with Conan O'Brien had been and was again, the Tonight Show with Jay Leno. And what happens when you inherit a show is you have to go through this period of sort of course correction where you're you have to go through a lot of effort to sort of transmogrify it into your show. Do you know what I mean? Which sure. takes a long time. It takes a while. And also you're always going to be compared against the other guy. Right. And so what happens with this show is this is the first time that it was it was a completely new show. Do you know what I mean? It sure. was a it was a show and they said you can call it whatever you want, you can do whatever you want. And there was the sense that, okay, I'm not, this is the first thing I'm doing. It's not a hand me down. You right. Know what I mean, sure. I, I got to go make my own suit of clothes. And I think there's a lot of comfort there. I mean, when I went over there just to visit that time, I was like, you know, before you had me on, there was this moment where I saw everybody from the old show and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I almost like teared up a little bit. I literally almost teared up doing the show. Is really? that ridiculous? No. I mean, there's sort of an emotional connection. I think there's also something nice, which is we were both in New York. Do you remember how crazy you were at the beginning? Yeah. What do you mean crazy? Like in what way? Crazy. Well, I just mean like, like, because I did that. I did your old show in the first year. Right. I, I did stand up and I think I did my first panel maybe in the second year. But like there was like, I, you're still a very intense person, but there was a, you, I mean, you would sit at your desk and your hands would be clenched. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was, I was, uh, I remembered. Has that uh, gone away? Yeah. Oh yeah. My, I mean, it has, it never goes away. I mean, I'm going to, I can, uh. I think that's the one part of me that would be the biggest surprise to people. You know, my friend uh, Robin Flender made a documentary of this tour we just did yeah. and uh, last year, a year ago, and he followed me around. And the biggest surprise is just how intense I can be and about everything uh, with, related to my work. And... Um, I think people, it's a bit of a disconnect. People think, well, he's the happy-go-lucky, silly guy with the funny hair. And he's like, nah, yeah. But in 93, 94, I remember realizing, or I, it, it, I very much knew that I've got to make this I, it, it work. Because if I don't survive this, there's nothing else. I and mean, I really did have that feeling. Because you decided, you know, what was the evolution of deciding to perform? I mean... The evolution was I had always been doing it. It had always been this thing that I'd been pushing for, but it was trying to figure out what is it I do. I knew that I was not a stand-up. I knew improvisation was the one thing that came the closest to feeling this is me. But how do you how do you uh, right? How do you do that? I worked at Saturday Night Live. I was friends with Dana Carvey and John Lovitz, and I used to look at them and think, I'm not a Phil Hartman. I'm not a Dana Carvey. I don't do what those guys do. Yeah. I also don't think that I'm a comedic actor. I don't I don't think I should be in a movie. I don't think I should ever be in a situation where I'm telling a woman on camera, I love you. You are the reason that I decided to run this summer camp for kids, you know. Yeah. Um and uh I could never do that. I realized I went through in my early career checking off things that I wasn't. Right. That's what I remembered. And then I remembered the one thing and this is going to sound like I'm making this up, but I'm not. In the 80s, I remembered seeing, for the uh, in the early 80s, I'd watch Letterman and I'd say, I don't know what it is he's doing, but I feel like I, there, it's some, I had this just feeling that I have a certain point of view and I have a certain comedic voice and I can kind of write and I'd like to present sketches and tell some jokes, but most, but also be able to talk to people because I like to be in the moment with them and riff. And that job looks like it combines a bunch of those things, but I have no idea how you how do you get one of those jobs. I still don't know how you get one of those jobs. Well, I, you were a writer at The Simpsons, right? When you when you sort of and then yeah. you before and then you came back. I to had SNL? done Saturday Night Live. Right. No, I didn't come back to SNL. I did Saturday Night Live, and that's where I got to know Lorne, and that's the Lorne Michaels, and that was the key to the story. Is that Lorne? Then I was on The Simpsons, and then immediately NBC needed a host right away. They didn't think. I don't think they were prepared for David Letterman to leave. But you kicked ass on The Simpsons. Uh, I don't know if I, I mean, I, I think I did a good job there, but I I was in a room with great, I mean, those writers, John Schwartzwelder and Vidi and Jeff Martin and uh, Reese and Gene and um, George Meyer. I mean, those are uh, 
just some of the best comedy writers I think of our time. And so being in a room with them was humbling. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I didn't think I was like the hot shot in the room. Right. It wasn't, it wasn't like Top Gun. Right. Um, so the call from Lauren was that a surprise? Uh, it was. Yeah. Initially, he called me up and he was interested in having me produce the show, and I didn't want to do it. And I remembered that I had just turned down, and my agent had wanted me to get an overall deal at Fox to keep working on The Simpsons. And I said, I don't want to do that. And I'd been talking to Lisa Kudrow. She and I had done improv together for years. In, and this is before, obviously, before Friends. And we talked about maybe putting together our own show and getting you it dated on a bit. Seat. Yeah, so you could say that, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see what you're doing. No, I'm not doing anything. You're the Chuck Woolery of Yeah, come on. Podcasts. Chuck Woolery? How do I get Chuck Woolery? I don't know. You just have a, your jacket similar to his. I'm just trying to, you know, confirm, uh, you know, bits and pieces of information that sure. I have with the yeah. guy that, you know, knows. That's good. Yeah, no, I, you can ask me anything, uh, and, I'll, and I'll sort of... Uh, deflect it and deflect make fun it. of me? Deflect it and make fun of you and put you on the defensive and okay. hurt you in some small way. No hurting. Um, not with the hating. So, okay, so you, 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 you. And then, and so I turned, and then Lauren came back and said, I think he had, uh, didn't know what to do. He hadn't found anybody or he had. But you just turned down, uh, the, the, your agent, you said, no, I don't want to over, I'll deal with Fox, which right. would have been money. And you turned down Lauren Michaels, which right. r really is not an easy thing to do, I would imagine. No, but I was, I just, you know, I have, uh, if I have one thing, it's instincts. I just have instincts about, and, and they often don't make sense to me, but I have instincts. I mean, it's, you know, the last year and a half of my career has been all me just having a strong feeling for what's the right thing for me to do, and I do it. And I don't even know what the consequence is going to be, but it tends to work out. It tends to... If because I, you know you couldn't live with the other thing. Yeah, I know. That's all I know. And I knew that I didn't want to do that. And then Lauren called me back and he said, do you want to audition for it? And I remember thinking, well, I'll audition for it. I'll... I'll What's the harm in that? And I think I was so loose in my audition because I thought I didn't really have any chance of getting it. And I had a really great audition. I mean, but did you, now was Lauren? I was, I was funnier in my audition than I was on, you know, the, the, and than I was on the late night show for like a year and a half. Was your relationship with him? I mean, because he's sort of a, an intimidating Buddha-like, you know, mm -hmm. you can go evil or good Buddha, I guess, right. on any given day. Yeah. Did I, he? Did he impart uh, wisdom in you? Uh, Lorne is, I mean, I have a lot of respect for him and he's probably more than anybody in show business, uh, influence had been a huge influence on me. And yeah, he does impart, Lorne has very good taste. Lorne has very good taste and he has a good, um, he has, he's a thinker and he thinks a lot and I think he has a good intuitive feel for what people should do and what they shouldn't do. And, um, you know, early on in the late night show, there wasn't too much he could tell me. I think he knew you just have to survive this period, and if you survive it, you'll uh, you can only learn by doing. Do you know what right. I mean? There's no there's no book that you can read that tells you what to do. You just have to go in, and uh, I probably have a Catholic need to suffer. That helps me. So, the, um, when, so when... so the trials and tribulations that I went through in ninety three, ninety four probably was was my way of paying whatever dues I felt I needed to pay to keep that show. And then once I had suffered enough, there was part of me that was like, all right. I <laughs> yeah. And now uh, I could move on to another level. And that's probably what happened. So that really that really did have that, uh, you know, Catholicism has that kind of effect. Like, because I have no familiarity with it. But the idea of suffering to, to that that's part of life is really something that's plowed into your brain. Yeah, it's it gets into your DNA. And I'm really trying uh, very hard in the last couple of years like you're think, not doing it right if you're not suffering. Yeah, I'm trying to re uh, and, and you know what my my uh escape from that was always comedy. Comedy was always something that I could get into a zone and you can have a really good time and people can really be laughing and I would think later on, wait a minute, people liked that and I was enjoying myself and I was in the moment and I wasn't self-conscious. So comedy was always my escape valve. And that then the tricky thing was I turned it into a career and when you turn the thing you love into a career, you're take you're playing with fire. Well, I think. Well, I think also that's like the nature of what you were talking about about how you do it, because it 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 seems like the way you execute your your comedy, it's it's almost as if you're running for your life. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that. I think that. Does uh, that make sense? It's not meant you know, as an no, insult. No, no. It, 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 it. Uh, you know, I get as intense. People think, you know, doing the show would be nerve wracking, but giving a toast at a wedding wouldn't be. Right. And you've probably had this feeling. Right. Anytime you get up in front of people. And whether or not you're funny is being put on the line, you're intense about it. Do you know? Yeah, oh yeah. And, oh and yeah. people don't understand. I've seen people say, well, you're just giving a toast at a wedding. Why are you getting nervous about this? And I'll say, because it needs to be really great. Uh, I've, you know, I've had done things on that have been broadcast in front of, you know, whatever, 10 million people or something. But And then I've gotten up at a wedding that there are only 35 people there. But if you're speaking in front of a group of people, it's it's life or death to me. And the reason I'm not an athlete is that I don't give a shit if the ball goes in the hoop or not. I never cared enough. Yeah. And truly great athletes, yes, they're born with you know innate ability. But the thing that makes them great, the thing that made Pete Rose great is that he was willing to crush his rib cage if it meant catching the ball. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. He was willing to... <clears throat> Ke- where that ball is and, yeah. and him catching it or him hitting it was the most important thing in the world and I never had that in sports but I did have it about making a room full of people laugh that was the most important thing to me so yeah. I can see it you know because it, it's it's interesting when you look at because like I've talked to you a lot mm-hmm. on camera right and I know you you know when when there's one of those dead moments with me <laughs> that, or anyone yeah, yeah that you're gonna have to pick up. Like it's not it's not just gonna be a word. Like, you know, you're gonna you know, it's gonna be you. Yeah. Yeah. And and when you do something, even in conversation, uh, it, it you know, you go all out. Yes. And you feel it. And and that's just because and you describing it as this idea that like I'm in the present, I'm not in pain now, there's no suffering, and people are laughing. Yeah. That's that, but that's but you know, it's funny that I have always been I commit. I yeah. commit when I'm in, I'm in a hundred percent. Yeah. Or I don't, but I don't know how to do things part way. And it's been a problem for me because part of the world that we're in is yeah. you do your job, but then people say, hey, can you can you do this benefit? Can you do this? Can you do that? And they, they um, I've always envied musicians because if you're Paul Simon and someone says, can you come by our benefit? You pick up your guitar. <laughs> yeah, you sing an old you, song. You know, and you get up there and you sing Mrs. Robinson and everybody wets their pants. <laughs> yeah. And then you go and you, uh, uh, yeah. you know, uh, have a drink. Right. But if you're a comedian, you've got to try and think of what's this event, what's it going to be, how am I going to integrate this, and yeah. I, I I really sweat these things. Oh hell yeah, man! And so, as a result, they they uh, they ruin my marriage a little bit. They ruin my time with my kids. So I have I've had to start saying no more often because people don't realize what they're asking of you. Right. They're asking for some of your bone marrow when they're asking for Yeah, hours of your life. And And so, uh, and they're just, and it's going to make me miserably unhappy. Because you're stressing about it. Yeah, and, you know, the big change for me is I'm trying, to me, having kids is a big, you know, it's, there's part of you that thinks, I just got to grow up. I got to evolve. I have to evolve. I have to get to the point where I can do my work and not have it consume you, consume you, or be too painful. And the, especially the last year or so, and all the drama and everything, I've started to think, what's the point? You the know, energy of- it takes is fucking mind blowing. I mean, even when when I'm when I read that book, you know, it, it it taught me a couple of things in that, like I had no idea of the political dynamics of show business in general. Right. Now, I, I don't know how much you knew, but, you know, even as, you know, we all start out with agents and, you know, you have, uh, you know, you have a, a very, you know, powerful and aggressive manager. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, did you, when I read this thing, I'm like, it's more complicated than, than politics, than genuine politics. Right. That did you, was your, was your history education, were you aware of all this shit? I mean, like, I know, you know, Jeff Ross, your, uh, your producer is a sweet guy. I just couldn't believe the politics of this. I was, you know, yeah, I was aware that there's a lot of moving parts. I was aware that there's a lot of moving parts and that uh, there's a lot going on, uh, you know, below the surface because I'm not naive about those things. Um, And this is something I want to be clear about. There's, that I've tried to be really clear about in the last year. Yeah. Is that I've always accepted that when art and commerce come together, you're going to get uh, it's it, it's going to get messy. Um, and you just have to accept that. You know, I am not... That's why um, I try very hard 
to remind myself that it was always a relationship. It was always a business relationship. Do you know what I mean? I don't own the cameras. I, you know, General Electric wasn't doing me a favor. This was an ex this was an exchange, and I got something out of it, and we were together able to uh, come together and make this this uh, work for whatever sixteen, close to seventeen years. And um, but there's a lot of tension in the business. There's a lot of the business is going through a lot of change. There's a lot of panic. There's a lot of so. Um, I don't know. I always try to remind myself I'm not. You know, Thoreau just got got to go up to his room and write something, and no one bothered him. <laughs> right. And if I want to do that, I can go in my backyard and do some stuff, and no one's going to bother me or say boo. Um, I always knew that I was playing with big forces, you know? Yeah. And, and I don't mean that in a conspiratorial way. I mean, in a very, my eyes were open, and I knew that, um, that you know, a lot of people that work you know, in, in show business have had a rough time. Right. It can go well for a while and then it can get nasty. Um, the dismount can get really ugly. And, uh, and so I don't know. I was very aware that, that, uh, did I see this one coming? No. Uh, um, and it took me a while afterwards to process it. And I'm still, I think I'm still processing some of it, but, but I'm a big boy and I get that, you know, it's complicated, and I, what I'm trying to avoid is that thing where you get a story in your head that's very clean. Right, of course. That, you know, yeah. like, um, you know, uh, I think too many people A make plus a, B means I got fucked. Yeah, exactly, right. or, you know, and, and, and I think there are too many people that come up with a story as almost as a defense mechanism or survival mechanism, a very simple story where they're the hero and then they, they get it set and then that's in their head for the rest of their lives and they don't learn anything. And I'm, you know, I'm trying really hard to, to not do that. In, in the darkest moments of it all, I mean, what, you know, where did your brain go? I mean, what, to like... all the, to all the, I mean, the thing is now there are certain things, you know, I, re I was reading some piece by uh, uh, Malcolm Gladwell and he was talking about, uh, Man, I wish I could remember the name of the, what he called it. Um, creeping something. Uh, creeping determinism, I think. And basically what he was saying is that after an event, you watch a football game and your team loses because they go for it on fourth down. You know, Later on, you become convinced that you knew that that was a mistake to go for it on fourth down. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You create that story in your head. Whereas if you can really truthfully go back to that time... It's a great idea if it works. So there's a quality you can get sometimes afterwards where you can see, I knew this would happen, or I, I had a suspicion that this thing would happen, or, and a bunch of people do that. And probably, you know, in, in uh, Bill's book, there's a lot of creeping determinism where people are after the fact saying, I knew if I had only done X, Y, and Z that it wouldn't have happened. But basically they're... You won't read it? No, I won't read it. No, I mean I've had some. I have I have a lot of people around me that I really trust, and they read it, and they said, you know, it's. Are you mad at me for reading it? No. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's about you. No, no, no. I you know everyone's my my parents. I went home for Christmas, and my parents were like, "Oh, we're reading the book," <laughs> and they were they were acting like, "Isn't this? You're gonna love it. We're reading it, and we're almost done." And I, you know, I just thought it's. For them, it's they didn't quite understand that I don't want to even see it. You know, it's. But it's too... what what is your fear? I don't have a fear. It's just that it was painful to go through, and I don't want to. I felt that pain for you. Yeah, I, mean, I don't. I don't want to. And and you know, that's the thing is now I see how everything is played out, and a lot of people say you've come out better off, or it's worked out for you. Right. And I say, you know, in the moment when things were really dark, I had no concept that it might that it could all work out. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know if I was ever going to get back on TV again. I didn't know if I was going to get a nickel. I didn't know, if, you know, that I, I had no idea. But again, that thing I have that I've had all my life is I get a feeling about the right, what I need to do, and I do it, and I don't obsess about it. You know, when I finally decide what I'm going to do, I do it, and I move on. So, And then I'm pretty confident that somehow it'll work out. But in those darkest moments, were, were you just like, you know, sitting there clenching, going, I'm fucked, I'm fucked, what the fuck did I do? Or were you actually like, you know, like, I'm, I'm going to spend a year in Europe. 
I mean, no, you know, was, was, there I, a, was there a plan B in your head? No. You know, that's the funny thing is that that tour got uh, you out of you know, got me. Yeah. That was really good for me. I, I, I needed to uh, work through stuff and I needed to work through stuff in front of people. Were you talking candidly about that stuff or just blowing some steam off? I didn't see any of the shows. And no, there was a lot of no. I wasn't. I was not talking. I, I, you know, there were people that thought it was going to be a talk about what I had been through, and it was really just an excuse to do comedy. Sure. Because I thought, you know, uh, yeah. Um, and Get it, out of your it head. touched on it a lot, but re- really, but just being in front of people and and playing music and doing comedy, and I lost like twenty pounds on that tour, and I didn't sleep, and I was very intense, and I think. I was burning off something that was in me that needed to be burned off. And, uh, and you know, when it was done, my wife took a picture of me when I came home from it. And I was, I think it was like 171 pounds or something, which for me at 6'4 is really thin yeah, yeah, yeah. and kind of hollowed out. And I just, you know, I looked like I'd been on meth or something. And I think it was just burning through something that had to be burned through. And so... uh I was really grateful that I got to do that. But that was, again, that was something that I improvised off of the last show, the last Tonight Show, playing with Will Ferrell, playing Freebird. Um, but also the thrill of what we said before, when you do live comedy and you give it your all and you actually get into the present, get out of your head, yes. and you have the, the task of, of entertaining, probably in a way you hadn't before. You know, it was it was a different, it was a different pure, you know, I've always thought, my whole career has been it started with just oh you're a writer and you're in a back room and then you're and you're you have no contact with the actors and then i evolved finally to okay you're a writer and you get to work with the actors on a live show called Saturday Night Live and occasionally you get to be in something and then i drifted further away with the simpsons and i was determined i'm not going to drift further away i've got to get closer to this uh thing that i really want to do i just have to figure out how to do it and what is it and then uh doing the late night show really got me close to doing vaudeville, but not still close enough. And then right. the tour got me to vaudeville. And I think I just always wanted to get to vaudeville <laughs> to go back. I, you know, I like sure. to, I like playing old theaters. I like, I like everything about it. I like coming in through the stage door. I like thanking the crew afterwards in every city would get on a bus. I'd try and sleep on a bus. You know, um, I had backup singers were, you know, we're, Show business. backstage. It was show business, yeah. and I loved it. And so I've actually tried to take some of that spirit and that energy and take it into the new show, which is I just want to do a show, like the way Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland did Well, you did always a show. sort of did. Like, even back in the NBC days, I mean, I used to love being up there because of the – how uh, extravagant some of the bits would be. It wouldn't yeah. be unusual to see a horse. No. I always wanted to be in the kind of showbiz where you're backstage and there's a guy in a Nazi costume smoking a cigarette. There's a horse. There's a showgirl. There's guys dressed as Siamese twins yeah, who are about yeah. to go out there. There's, you know, a Gandhi who's about to be shot out of a cannon. And people backstage in ridiculous costumes shouting at each other angrily is my favorite thing. Yeah, there's um, a, there was always that there. It yeah, definitely and, feels that way. And I think that was a... Uh, that was definitely a feeling of, uh, I don't know. I finally got to have that experience that I always wanted to have, where you like run away and join the circus, you know? Because right. uh, it's to me that was what that tour was all about. Was was and and like you said, that got me out of my head, you know. Uh, and I really enjoyed it and almost forgot about everything I had just gone through. Right. And then, of course, the problem is when the tour ended, it started to creep back into my head, you know. So how do you feel, like, now about, you know, the show you're doing? And I really and... love the show we're doing, and I love that, you know, there was a lot of discussion with what bits can Conan do from the old show. And I remember thinking, fuck it. Yeah. Let's, let's actually not do anything from the old show. Even if I was allowed to do stuff from the old show, which I might be, you know, I, we haven't legally tested it. I thought, screw it. I want to, um, I want to, let's, t- I don't want to do bits for 30 years in a row. Do you know what I mean? And right. We, and we did a bunch of things that people really liked on the old show. And I think, okay, but we did them. We did them all. Right. And now it's time to try and make something new. So we have, a self-imposed don't do anything from the old show ever from, from any of the old shows either from of them? any of them we don't do anything we just only do we try and think of new stuff and we try and make it a lot more uh 
immediate, you know, and tonight I work off the crowd a lot and I find people in the audience That's, and I do yeah. things. And, you know, it used to be, we used to be too clever for that. You know, the old show is too clever for that. And we're trying to be, my whole thing is, no, let's just try and find these real moments. Let's make it. Uh, That's make, interesting. You know. Was it too clever or were you guys just nervous about it? Were you just oh, like, in the early days, we were, we had a mission, which was on the late night show. I didn't want to do anything. I want it to be a completely different show from what David Letterman had done. And we really want it to be packed full of cool ideas. Who were the minds behind that? You and Smigel? Robert Smigel. Louis? And Louis C.K. And Dino? Dino Stamatopoulos. And uh, we um, we used to just, you know... Get as weird as possible. Try and get as weird as possible and really try and put it... You know, God, it's that old saying that I love, which is God is in the details. Yeah. I always thought the really great comedy that I re admired, like SCTV, just yeah. had so much nuanced detail in there and I thought that's what we want to do and we want to make the show that that uh, I want people watching it to think I can't believe they went to all this trouble right. and so what happens is you do that for a long time we did it and I do think we're in kind of a different era now just as a uh, you know I've done that and I've worked through it and then I over time you start to realize okay I'm probably not that guy anymore that's up to someone else to do the really crazily weird thing that you spent 17 hours making right and it's only on tv for 15 seconds i don't think i have that in me anymore i have a different thing now and i gotta you know it's we well, are like, grown up well it's also kids. yeah exactly but also it's life. it's like uh you can't uh i always think the best analogy is probably a pitcher you know you can't be a 55 year old that's blowing people away with your fastball but you learn to throw all kinds of weird junk and yeah. and and still you can win the game right now, does this broadening of the show in the sense of, of I, I imagine it has to do with two things that, you know, the experience of hosting the Tonight Show and the weird pressures that came with that, but also the experience of realizing that you've got a fan base that is, you know, passionate, they're young, right. they they showed up for you on the road, yeah, yeah. they showed up for in a very human way. Right. Do you feel that uh, you owe them the, the, the humanity that you're now showing? Uh, that's a really good question. I feel that... Um... I think some of it, it's it's not so much that I owe it to them. I am a guy that really wants, I, I will walk over hot coals for people that have tolerated my comedy. Uh, and um, I'm very appreciative of people that that uh, come up to me anywhere and say, I saw X, Y, or Z that you did over the years. It I do feel like a, a, a real strong connection with them. But I think it's just also the point that I'm at in my life, which is... Um, you know the I took a every 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 the way in which the Tonight Show ended was everybody knew the story and it was a very human situation and I think I allowed it to be a human situation and I think realized that opened me up to it's okay you know people can know that I'm disappointed whatever as long as I'm not self pitying and as long as I we try and make it funny as opposed to a business situation yeah exactly right. I felt like I can be honest with people uh, and. I think some of the stuff that I talked about on the last Tonight Show resonated with people, and it was honest, and I felt like, all right, well, I let's keep going with this. Let's just keep trying to let people in, let people in a little bit, and on the road, let them in. And, um, and I don't mean in a uh, – I don't want to – exploit anything that's happened to me but i want to try and turn it into comedy in yeah. some way and uh it's what i the other thing too i've learned is that not everything there was so much pressure on me early on in my career i felt like everything had to be funny all the time and i'm less that way now i don't think it's realistic and i think it's also kind of you know that's hard to watch when someone's you know let there be moments let things draw out let things you know find the good stuff and also you, know I mean? you have a, make it you have some wisdom you've been through some shit yeah you're you're more available uh, emotionally right you know you don't have to be you know flailing and afraid anymore yep so i mean you know it makes sense to learn how to communicate in that way like did you what i mean do you go look at like who are your biggest influences in retrospect i mean that you know in in terms of show business well i think the uh you know, when we were growing up, um, I want to say we, when you and I grew up together yeah. in that shack. Sure, that uh, was great. Yeah, Walden. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, I was very influenced by a lot of people, but, you know, Carson was on. He was sort of the only game in town. I remember thinking, you know, 
that he Who made my dad laugh. Oh, I watched it with my dad. Yeah. And, uh, but, um, and he made your dad laugh. He made my dad laugh. And I remember thinking, you know, you're really interested as a kid. Like to me, it was very important to know who's making my dad laugh. Could you? Yeah, I could. Yeah. And, but I remember thinking like, okay, this is, that was probably my first hook into yeah. looking at what that guy was doing yeah. and thinking that'd be cool. Yeah. Uh, um, and you know, much later on, obviously Letterman was an influence, but just a kid growing up, I mean, I was, uh, you know, I remember just my brothers and I were very much interested in comedy. And so early Sound Out Live, sure. SCTV, SCTV was huge for me. I remember that really broke it delighted, open. Yeah, broke it open for me. I just saw, man, the level of, you know, it, it influenced everything so much. It was the closest thing we had to Monty Python. Sure. Um, Did you study the old, uh, the talk show host, though, like, you know, Jack Parr, Steve Allen? No, I never studied them. I saw them and they were, you know, they were all did it very differently, but I always thought, Everyone's working in their own time that it's very hard to learn lessons from them. The medium is so different. Right. The culture's so different. Right. Uh, you know, that I never really believe in learning from the old masters. I mean, basically, I like to keep it really simple. Does somebody make you laugh? Right. Jonathan Winters and Mad, 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 Mad World makes me laugh. Have you talked to him? I've never, no, I haven't spoken to him. No. I, I had a weird thing, like, uh, you know, Dan Pasternak knows him, the guy right. from IFC, and I want to have him on the show, and I was going to go yeah. to Santa Barbara to interview him. And I got this call on my cell phone. It was Jonathan Winters. Oh, wow. And I called him back, and I was hysterical. I mean, he, you know, there's, and he's still got that thing. Yeah. He's he got an amazing you... story. You know, I saw him in a restaurant, I want to say like six months ago. Yeah. And I'm not shy, but I was too, I didn't want to go, I didn't want to bother him. Yeah. You know, and sometimes when I see, when I see these really great comedians that made me laugh when I was a kid, I don't want to bother them. You know, yeah. and then other later on, I told people, I said, they said, why didn't you go up to him? And I said, I don't know. He might not know who I am, and I don't want to bother him and stuff like that. And people said, well, you know, you should have. And I don't. I feel like there's an aura around someone like that. I, remember, I saw him up in Santa Barbara at a restaurant. Yeah. I didn't want to invade his space. Yeah. I think when people made you laugh as a kid, you yeah. deify them. Oh, yeah. And I remembered being in the... Four Seasons in Los Angeles in like 1987. Yeah. And looking across the room and Don Knotts was sitting there <laughs> with this like very attractive woman and he was, you know, eating a Cobb salad or something. Yeah. And I just couldn't believe. I mean, Tom Cruise could have been at the next table and I wouldn't have cared. Right. It was Don Knotts. <laughs> it's Barney Fife. It's Mr. Limpet. <laughs> And it's always amazing, you know, yeah. you, you see those people. Isn't it weird when you see them up close? Do you find that in show business sometimes? Like even when I, like if I do, uh, if I go on uh, Letterman or even on, on your show that, you know, and I'm talking to you like this yeah, yeah. when we're just people, but when you're like in the lights and yeah. you're, things are about to happen, when you see them as just people, you're like, oh my God, he's just a guy. Well, it's funny too. I don't know about you. I get, if I meet really famous people, I become obsessed with. You know, like you just look at their knuckle or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. uh, I was in a situation once where I'm at this very small dinner party, and then before you know it, like Paul McCartney's there, and all I can do is just, I was like looking at his hand. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the hand that was, <laughs> you know, at the Wilton yeah. feet, you know, when he met John in 1950. You know, like, okay. That hand has traveled. Yeah, yeah. exactly. What is he, uh, you know, that's the same knuckle. That, yeah. and, you, and then you realize, okay, you're, you got to just back out of that world. Yeah. The minute you start to go into that world, you got to back out of the it. The knuckle but I, world? Yeah, but I, and I've had the same experience of, you know, you see these people, you see like a David Letterman in person, yeah. and you're just, you know, you're, yeah, you're struck by that nostril. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, okay, right just there. back away. Just let it go. <laughs> have, you ever met, have you ever had someone on the show that you were just like, oh, my fucking God. I can't believe this is happening. Yeah, you definitely have sort of an out of body experience, and and like I said, it's not with people like a Brad Pitt or something. Right. Because I don't have that feeling for my right. contemporaries. Yeah, but I, you know, I did have it for Richard Harris. Right, when he was right. On our sure. show. I yeah. did have it for Andy Griffith when I interviewed him. Uh, I, I, you know, there's just a, sort of a little bit of an out of body experience oh, yeah, yeah. where you're seeing someone that you watched from a high chair. Yeah. <laughs> You look yeah. like baloney strips in a bowl in front of you, and in the you, magic box. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and they and now they're with you, and none of it's real. And you know what? It isn't real. It's yeah. all it's all ridiculous. It's, it's all show business. It's all. But I mean, it's it it's good. To, it is magical. It is strange and fantastic. It's a heightened reality. <laughs> but you know, I think there's if you don't if you can't connect to, uh, 
you know, I'm not a cynical person and I don't, I, I do, I'm still connected to, I can't believe we're all here. I, yeah. that's how I feel. Like, yeah. I feel like, you know, tonight driving out here to your garage, it's, I have a little bit of a feeling of, it's so weird that I knew you in, you know, you yeah. and I are in 6A in 1993 right. in front of a mustard colored set, yep. uh, m- making our way through something in front of, you know, and now here it is almost 20 years later and we're in Los Angeles in this weird magical land that I'm coming to here. And I believe in staying connected to that stuff. Like yeah. well, that's the thing that makes it all yeah. sort of, uh, it's a weird ride. Yeah. I don't know where it's, and I'm, <laughs> man, it's getting yeah. weirder all the time. It is. And I don't know where it's going. I don't yeah. know, you know, but, uh, I, you know, I want to see it through. Well, you seem great. You look great and you're doing, uh, you're doing good work and I'm, I'm glad you came by. Oh, thanks for having me. Okay, man. Okay, that's our show. I hope you enjoyed that. I want to thank Conan O'Brien. What an amazing privilege and treat it was to have him in here. I hope you're all well. If you're in Australia, I will be at the Melbourne, Melbourne, Melbourne Comedy Festival, the 24th through the 12th. How's that? Let's go backwards. Isn't that how it works in Australia? The 12th through the 24th of this month. On the 8th of this month, I will be in Milwaukee at the Turner Ballroom. Uh, with Eugene Merman and Kristen Shaw. And as always, thank you for listening. And better yet, remember, if you go to mergerecords.com slash store, this is the label that has Arcade Fire, Spoon, Super Chunk, Destroyer. Go to mergerecords.com slash store, get 20% off with the code WTF. Man, what a fucking show. That's it. That's all of it. Okay. <laughs>